Welcome to Lecture 18, Section 5.1 of the text Elements of Modern Algebra by Gilbert and Gilbert, 8th edition. Rings. A group is one of the simpler algebraic systems because it has only one binary operation. A step upward in the order of complexity is the ring. A ring has two binary operations called addition and multiplication. Conditions are made on both binary operations, but fewer are made on multiplication. A full list of the conditions is in our formal definition of a ring. Recall that for groups, there were four axioms that needed to be verified before a set could be considered as a group. In the case of a ring, there are eight axioms, or we could even say nine. Subsection 5.1.1 Definition of a Ring Suppose R is a set in which a relation of equality denoted by the equal sign and operations of addition and multiplication denoted by the addition and multiplication signs respectively are defined then R is said to be a ring with respect to these operations, addition and multiplication, if the following conditions are satisfied or if the following axioms are satisfied. And there are eight, or we could say nine of these axioms. Number one, the set R is closed under addition, i.e., if x and y are elements in R, then x plus y is an element in R. Condition 2. Addition in R is associative, i.e., for every x, y, z in R, x plus parentheses, y plus z equals x plus y in parentheses plus z. Condition 3. R contains an additive identity 0 i.e., for every x in R, x plus 0 equals 0 plus x, and that equals x. Condition 4, R contains additive inverses, i.e., for every x in R, there exists negative x in R, such that x plus negative x equals negative x plus x, and that equals 0. Condition 5, Addition in R is commutative, i.e., for every x, y in R, x plus y equals y plus x. Now, I want you to observe that these first five conditions actually state that R is an abelian group with respect to addition. Closed, associative, has an identity element, has inverses, and is commutative, that is an abelian group, with respect to addition. Condition number six, R is closed under multiplication, i.e., for every x, y in R, x times y is an element in R, and seven, multiplication in R is associative, i.e., for every x, y, z in R, x times parentheses, y times z equals parentheses, x times y times z. And condition 8, two distributive laws hold in R, left distributivity and right distributivity. And if we split this into two, then we would say there are nine conditions that must be satisfied on a set R for the set to be called a ring. Now let's summarize this. Subsection 5.1.2 Alternative Definition of a Ring Suppose R is a set in which a relation of equality denoted by the equal sign and operations of addition and multiplication denoted by the addition and the multiplication signs respectively are defined, 
Then R is a ring with respect to the operations of addition and multiplication if these conditions hold. Number one, R forms an abelian group with respect to addition. These are the first five conditions. Two, R is closed with respect to an associative multiplication. This would give you properties six and seven above. R is closed under multiplication and R is associative under multiplication. And three, two distributive laws hold in R, left distributivity and right distributivity. So these three conditions summarize the eight conditions we saw in section 5.1.1 above. Examples. Example one. E. The set of all even numbers is a ring with respect to the usual addition and multiplication in the set of integers C. 2. The set R defined as the set of all elements of the form M plus N root 2 where M is an even number and N is an element in Z is a ring. Let's verify one of these. Number 1. E is a set of all elements in Z such that X equals 2K, where K is an element in Z. This is how we define even numbers. We have to verify that all eight conditions hold on E. Number one, let X and Y be elements in E required to prove X plus Y is an element in E, i.e. the sum of two even numbers is an even number. The proof of that will be left as a simple exercise for serial students. Recall that if x is an element in E, then x is of the form 2k1. If y is an element in E, then y is of the form 2k2, k1, k2 integers. So show that x plus y equals some 2k wiggle, where k wiggle is an element in z. I'll leave that as a simple exercise for serial students. Condition 2, associativity under addition. Now, associativity is hereditary. The set of even numbers is a subset of the set of integers, and the set of integers is associative with respect to addition. Therefore, the set of even numbers E is associative with respect to addition. 3, R contains an additive identity 0. Let x equal 0, then 0 is 2 times 0, which is an element in E, and that is the additive identity in E. We can observe that for every x in E, x plus 0 equals 0 plus x equals x. Condition 4, existence of additive inverses. For every x in E, x equals 2k, where k is an integer. Negative x equals negative 2k, which equals 2 times negative k. And that is an element in E because negative k is an integer. Also, x plus negative x equals negative x plus x, and that equals 0. The additive identity. So additive inverses exist in E, and precisely... If x is in E, its additive inverse is negative x. Condition number five is commutativity with respect to addition. Again, commutativity is hereditary. And since the set of integers is commutative with respect to addition, and the set of even numbers is a subset of the set of integers, we can conclude that a set of even numbers is commutative with respect to addition addition. Condition 6. Closure with respect to multiplication. Let x and y be elements in E. We have to prove that x times y is an element in E. But x an element in E implies that x equals 2k1 for some k1 in z. y an element in E implies that y equals 2k2 for some element k2 in z. Therefore, x times y equals 2k1 times 2k2, and that equals 2 into 2k1 times k2.
K1 is an integer, K2 is an integer, the product of three integers is an integer, so all of these is some integer K wiggle, and therefore 2 into 2 K1, K2 is an element in E, it's an even number. Therefore, x times y is in E, and we say that a set of even numbers is closed under multiplication. Condition 8. Left and right distributivity are hereditary properties. Since these distributivity properties hold on Z, we have conditions 1 through 8 satisfied, we can conclude that E is a ring. Now, E was a very simple set to deal with. Now, what I want you to do next is to show that the set R defined as follows is a ring. Subsection 5.1.3 definition, subring. Whenever a ring R1 is a subset of a ring R2 and has addition and multiplication as defined in R2, then we say that R1 is a subring of R2. Just as we did with groups, we would state a characterization of subrings known as the subring criterion. And these are the properties that you would need to verify in order to prove that a subset R1 of a ring R2 is actually a subring of R2. Subsection 5.1.4 Theorem The Subring Criterion A subset S of a ring R is a subring of R if and only if these conditions are satisfied. A. S is non empty. B. S is closed under addition and multiplication. 3. S has additive inverses. So if I give you a set S, which is a subset of a ring R, to verify that S is a subring, all you have to do is verify that these three properties hold. As a matter of fact, we can compress the subring criterion into what I call the condensed subring criterion. Subsection 5.1.5 Theorem Characterization of a Subring A subset S of a ring R is a subring of R if and only if these conditions are satisfied. Number one, S is non empty. And number two, for every x, y in S, x minus y is in S and x times y is in S. Now, I want you to observe that x minus y in S satisfies the conditions of closure under addition and existence of additive inverses. Example, prove that this subset of the set of real numbers S, whose elements are of the form m plus n root 2, where m and n are integers, is a subring of the ring of all real numbers. Again, all we have to do is verify that S is non-empty, and for every x, y in S, we verify that x minus y is in S, and x times y is in S. A. 2 plus 3 root 2 is an element in S, since 2 and 3 are integers. Therefore, S is non-empty. You can pick any element of the form m plus n root 2, provided m and n are integers, and that would suffice to conclude that s is non-empty. Next condition, let x and y be in s. We have to prove x minus y and x times y in s. But x in s implies that x is of the form m1 plus n1 root 2, where m1 and n1 are integers. y in s implies that y equals m2 plus n2 root 2, where m2 and n2 are integers. 
Therefore, x minus y is m1 plus n1 root 2, all in parentheses, minus m2 plus n2 root 2, all of that in parentheses, and that equals m1 minus m2 in parentheses, plus n1 minus n2 in parentheses times root 2. m1 is an integer, m2 is an integer, the difference of two integers is an integer, so all of this is some m wiggle, which is an integer n1 is an integer, n2 is an integer, the difference of two integers is an integer, so all of this is some n wiggle, which is an integer. Therefore, we have succeeded to write x minus y as m wiggle plus n wiggle root 2, and that is an element in S. Therefore, x minus y is an element in S. We now verify that x, y is an element in S x times y equals m1 plus n1 root 2, all of that in parentheses, times m2 plus n2 root 2, all of that in parentheses. Expanding all of these and bringing like terms together, we have m1 plus m2 plus 2n1 n2. Observe that all of these would be an integer because the sum of integers is an integer and the product of integers is an integer. Similarly, we would have on the second component m1 times n2 plus m2 times n1, all of that in parentheses, times square root of 2. Observe that this also would be an integer because the sum of integers is an integer and the product of integers is an integer. Therefore, this would be an element in S, i.e., we have just shown that x times y is an element in S, and therefore we can conclude that S is a subring of the ring of all real numbers. Subsection 5.1.6 Definition Ring with unity and commutative rings. Let R be a ring. If there exists an element E in R such that X times E equals E times X equals X for every X in R, then we call E a unity and R is a ring with unity. 2. If multiplication in R is commutative, then R is called a commutative ring. Now, put both of these together. If R has unity and R is a commutative ring, then we say that R is a commutative ring with unity. That will be a ring that satisfies all the eight properties that we have seen above, plus it has the multiplicative identity and it is also commutative multiplicatively. So there are 10 properties to verify if we have to prove that a given set is a commutative ring with unity. Let's look at an example. Verify that a set of integers z is a commutative ring with unity. Number two, verify that zn is also a commutative ring with unity, and in this case, the unity is the congruence class of 1. In the first case, you can verify that the unity is the number 1. Solution for the first example. Verify that Z is a ring. Show that all eight axioms hold. I will leave that as a simple exercise for serious students. B. X times Y equals Y times X for every X, Y in Z. So Z is a commutative ring. C. For every x in z, x times 1 equals 1 times x equals x, and 1 is an element in z. So we say that 1 is the unity in z. Therefore, z is a commutative ring with unity. What about zn? Observe that zn is a set of congruence classes, 0, 1, 2, right up to n minus 1. I want you to verify that all 10 properties hold on Zn. Therefore, Zn is a commutative ring with unity, and the unity is the congruence class of 
one. It's very easy, and at this point in abstract algebra, you should be able to do this very quickly. Subsection 5.1.7 Theorem Uniqueness of the unity. If R is a ring that has unity E, then the unity E is unique. I leave the proof of this as a simple exercise for serious students. As a matter of fact, we've seen the proof before. It is the same as the proof of the identity element of a group is unique. So go back and look at that proof and do the same for a ring. Subsection 5.1.8 Definition Multiplicative Inverse Let R be a ring with unity and let A be an element in R. If there exists an element X in R such that A times X equals X times A equals E, then X is a multiplicative inverse of A and A is called a unit or an invertible element in R. So even if we prove that R is a ring with unity, it does not automatically imply that every element in R has an inverse. Those elements that have inverses are called units or they are called invertible elements in R. And subsection 5.1.9 states the uniqueness of the multiplicative inverse. Suppose R is a ring with unity, E. If an element A in R has a multiplicative inverse, then the multiplicative inverse of A is unique. Once more, the proof of this is left as a simple exercise for serious students because we have seen it before. It is the same proof as the proof of the inverse of an element in the group is unique. So go back and check out that proof. Subsection 5.1.10 Theorem Zero Product For every element A in R, A times zero equals zero times A equals zero. And in subsection 5.1.11, we define the zero divisor. Let R be a ring and let A be an element in R. If A is different from zero and there exists another element in R, B, that is also different from zero, such that A times B or B times A equals zero, then A is called a proper divisor of zero in R or simply a zero divisor in R. As a matter of fact, both A and B are zero divisors in R. Observe that a set of integers Z does not have any zero divisors. The set of real numbers does not have any zero divisors. The set of rational numbers does not have any zero divisors. What about Z10? The Congress class of 2 is an element of Z10. The Congress class of 5 is an element of Z10, and both are different from 0. But the Congress class of 2 times the Congress class of 5 is 0. So we say that 2 and 5 are 0 divisors. Subsection 5.1.12 Additive Inverses and Products For every x, y, z in R the following equalities whole A, B, C, D, E The proofs of these would be left as simple exercises for serious students. You can consult your text, Elements of Modern Algebra by Gilbert and Gilbert, to find some of these proofs. Also, you can go to section 2.1 of the same text on postulates of integers, and you would find some of the proofs. Subsection 5.1.13 Theorem Generalized Associative Laws. Let n be greater than or equal to 2. A1, A2, up to AN denote elements of a ring R. Then for any positive integer M, M greater than or equal to 1, strictly less than N, 
I can define the generalized associativity law with respect to addition as follows, and the generalized associativity law with respect to multiplication as follows. Subsection 5.1.14 Theorem Generalize distributivity laws. Let n be greater than or equal to 2, and b, a1, a2, a n be elements of a ring R, then I can define the generalized left distributivity property as follows, and I can define the generalized right distributivity property as follows. This brings us to the end of section 5.1 on rings. And if we have time, we shall look at further sections dealing with homomorphisms and isomorphisms. Thank you, and God bless you.